preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. I'm Daniel Stern, Director of the Humanities at the Y. I'd like to welcome you to the first of the two evenings sponsored jointly by the 92nd Street Y and the New Criterion, a journal of high critical distinction. Uh, before I introduce this evening's moderator, Samuel Lipman, who will in turn um, join Professor Bloom, uh, let me remind you that this is indeed a series, albeit of two evenings, and that on Sunday, October 23rd at 7.30 p.m., Hilton Kramer, editor of the New Criterion and distinguished critic and author, will be speaking on the arts and humanities in a time of culture and cultural upheaval. The moderator on that occasion will be Lynn Cheney, chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, tickets, by the way, uh, I'm advised to suggest and mention, are on sale for that event at the box office and will continue to be as you need it. Now to tonight's moderator. Samuel Lippmann is the publisher of The New Criterion and the author of The House of Music, published in 1984. He is an individual of considerable achievement in the humanities and the, is as well a musician, a fine musician in his own right, which gives him, in my opinion, the ideal combination of qualifications to introduce to this audience tonight's speaker. Now, Samuel Lipman. Scarce 18 months ago, a prophet came to us out of the West, the Middle West. His qualifications for prophecy in late 20th century America were, to say the least, curious. Chief among these qualifications was a lifelong dedication to Plato, demonstrated by a scholarly translation complete with an extensive commentary of the Republic. For gainful employment, like the best prophets. Ours had actually been spending most of his time with the young, teaching at Yale, Cornell, Tel Aviv University, the University of Paris, and most recently serving as a professor in the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Also like his predecessors, our prophet became one by writing a book. He called it The Closing of the American Mind, and explained himself in a subtitle, How Higher Education Has Failed Democracy and Impoverished the Souls of Today's Students. Many prophet authors are called, but few are chosen. Ours found himself overnight a best-selling author, responsible for the number one book on the New York Times list week after week. When the dust began to settle, and it hasn't entirely settled yet, the closing of the American mind turned out to have sold more than half a million copies. Prophets, I need hardly tell you, are rarely bringers of good news. Ours told us that American colleges and universities are places for unlearning, and that our educational leaders are both miseducators and misleaders. He ascribed much blame for this state of affairs to the pervasive influence of radical politics and error-ridden philosophy, much he ascribed to the night side of modernity itself. He counseled a return to a platonic quest for truth as a virtue in itself, and he appeared to recommend that this return might properly begin with a rigorous study, at least by the best of our young, of Plato's very own words. For this, our prophet was attacked by a wide range of intellectual and social critics and found himself accused of everything from poor scholarship to rabid anti-feminism, anti-democracy, racism, and above all, that ultimate intellectual insult, elitism. Our prophet was especially vilified for one chapter in his book. Bearing the innocent-seeming title of music, this short essay did nothing less then identify the deadening effect of the all-pervasive genre of rock music on education and on, and on what he repeatedly and daringly chose to call the souls of the young. As one, the defenders of rock 
as a consuming way of life and as an endless mine for commerce, rose to deny the right of any outsider, anyone that is not a part of the complex network of rock fans, critics, and publicists, to speak of that to which so many millions have given up their lives. <laughs> we shall be concerned tonight with the question between our youth, their education, and what may euphemistically be called, as we have, popular music. The vastly courageous prophet, whom I have just described, is of course our speaker. I'm deeply honored to present to you Alan Bloom. Thank you very much, Mr. Lipman. As I stood back there listening, I was afraid that I would have to come with thunder and lightning, uh, uh, the, uh, carrying ten tablets, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the prophetic, uh, uh, the prophetic uh, robes sit uneasily on me. The, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I had been somewhat misinformed that there was going to be an intimate group. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, my, uh, th 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 this particular institution uh, is redolent with ancestral pieties for me. My father, who was a Jewish center worker, began his uh, work here, and he was, uh, as I grew up, the uh, director of the Jewish Community Center in Indianapolis, and this was the heroic place, and he organized forums uh, uh, you know, along the model of the 92nd Street Y. So actually to be here is, uh, well, I'm sorry, he's not here to see me. Uh, the, uh, I come uh, this, uh, this time with a much greater title to speak about these things than I did when I wrote. Uh, I spent 10 days in the same hotel with Michael Jackson this summer. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> Eh, that's that's quite an experience. I was at the Hotel Crillon, uh, you know, the kind of place I now go, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, and uh, the uh, the uh, of the 100 rooms, uh, 40 belonged to Mr. Jackson. Uh, uh, the <laughs> the head waiter complained to me. I served Nixon, Reagan, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and he won't let me serve him. The uh, the and the, and the, uh, there was uh, one a truly marvelous moment. I wish a photographer had caught it. A photographer probably did because there were you know ten thousand people constantly outside the hotel cheering. And uh, as I uh, uh, as I uh, uh, one night I really wanted to see him. You couldn't see him. Uh, 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 the, the, this little figure went racing out the front door into his bus and standing there watching him, uh, absolutely unrecognized, was Saul Bellow, uh, with those <laughs> enormous eyes. Uh, and it was a kind of, uh, you know, cultural commentary of, uh, of rare force. Uh, the, uh, now, the, uh, my book, the one that caused so much, uh, brought so much attention to me, uh, had a chapter, as uh, some of you know, and as Mr. Lipman has mentioned, on what I might call the music addiction of our time. Uh, it, but it was, uh, you know, in a way, it made the book famous. Uh, and it was, uh, but it, it, it was part of the con of a larger context, a kind of triptych in the first part of the book about the condition of youth today. And the uh, the the first was the first uh, segment was about books or about the lack of books, the lack of reading, the lack of the reading taste, the lack of the presence of fundamental books in the lives of the young. Uh, and the third part of that chapter concerned uh, relations, sexual relations, but all relationships uh, uh, and a kind of disconnectedness that is pervasive in those relationships today. 
and uh, the, the music was a kind of transition, you know, what took the place of books, and which somehow is an accompaniment to this scene of uh, human relations. Now, uh, precisely the prophetic picture of me, which some liked, uh, I was told uh, by a gentleman that I know who appeared before the Association of Christian Broadcasters. They said, how is Brother Bloom? Uh, uh, which was a very new situation for me. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, you meet a lot of people uh, when, you, when you have something like this happen. But of course, I did not suggest that the music was immoral, or certainly I did not concentrate on that aspect about uh, of uh, contemporary rock music. Might as well say uh, the word, uh, the R word, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, was, uh, uh, but was its philistinism. Um, you can say I brought somehow more uh, platonic than a mosaic focus to it. Uh, that uh, the uh, uh, I did not argue that it is revolutionary, except in certain claims. I argued rather that it is conformist, conformist both in its own ethos among the musicians, but also particularly. For young people, I mean, in that you can say I, I, I borrowed a page. I didn't, but uh, I did. But uh, I could have said to have been from uh, the, the Frankfurt School Marxist critics who said that about contemporary popular music, particularly jazz, that it uh, expressed uh, the apparently wild opinions and did not channel them into anything really radical. That it was the uh, the, uh, the non-conformist mode of conformism. The uh, the um, my uh, the original title of my book when the, Mr. Lipman says that uh, I gave the book this title in some sense I did but I have to be quite honest my original title and the one I was deeply attached to was Souls Without Longing. Uh, the, my, my publisher said uh, that their salesman said they didn't know what souls were, they didn't know what longing is. Uh, so, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, so, given that problem, I made a certain shift. But the, uh, 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 but entrepreneur in this sophisticated audience, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the notion of the soul with a. Uh, kind of natural aspiration uh, and uh, a world in which that aspiration was being uh, relaxed, that, na that natural tension, that longing for wholeness and so on, uh, uh, was going. And, uh, and it is this that was, uh, you can say, false satisfactions to sort of unbend, the, to use Nietzschean language, the bow of the soul. And th this was the direction I took. Uh, and uh, the, uh, my, my argument, uh, and I understand this simply to be an observation, is that this music is of extraordinary ubiquity. There was never a music that, in America, that cut across the whole country, perhaps even uh, throughout the whole world, and uh, also uh, horizontally and vertically the classes. Uh, and more than, uh, than that, its ubiquity meant to say that it was a continuous presence, something that involved constantly, that was everywhere, you know, in the Walkmans, on the TV, uh, that uh, this was a phenomenon, whatever one wanted to say about it, that it did require some pause uh, to, be, because it is something new, and somehow people were acting like this were, uh, was not new, that it was not fundamental. Uh, you know, and the education of the taste of the young is always <laughs> central. And when there is an enormous change in that taste or in the, uh, the, uh, the elements that contribute to that education, we are in an entirely new situation. And I, it was that that I, uh, that I concentrated on. You can say the ubiquity and the intensity of rock music is the most striking phenomenon from the outside. If one, as it were, uh, came from another planet, 
Uh, I think there has never been quite anything like this. Uh, the, um, and of course, it did, as I suggest, bridge the gap between educated and uneducated. And in that sense, it was very democratizing, but not democratizing in sharing with the uneducated, what used to be educated tastes, but rather the reverse. Uh, the, uh, now, th this was a description, not a prescription. Uh, the, uh, but it did draw violent attacks. I wasn't surprised by that. As a matter of fact, so much of the response to my book not only in uh, 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 not only in relation to this chapter, not the, even particular in relation to this chapter, has been violent. And of course, in general, when you move angers, uh, you've touched on something. It isn't just an object of contempt or indifference. And, I, from long experience as a teacher, knew that this was something that counted. Uh, I can say that in some sense, the criticism of this passage of the book, as opposed to the reaction to the book as a whole, uh, was uh, more zachlich. I mean, in the sense that uh, uh, the uh, people actually read this chapter, at least the one part of it uh, that had to do with rock music. I, I, in the, uh, it was part of a general interpretation, or, statement uh, about uh, the meaning of music, you know, and the totality of life, and you know, with, uh, r with reference somehow to the classic and the philosophic tradition. But that those passages um, did catch people's attention. They spoke about them. I mean, I, I'm not here to talk about the book or to defend it uh, particularly, but uh, most of the other criticism is, you know, uh, sexist, racist, elitist, uh, the great, uh, the great trinity, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, w without any attempt to say what I said that uh, would, uh, uh, would, uh, uh, qualify me uh, uh, for that kind of punishment. Uh, but, but, but here there was an actual, some kind of actual mean, meeting. Now, the issue, as I would pose it, is my account true? Is this music of this character? And the issue, whether it's good or bad, would somehow be secondary, although the truth of the account and some kind of reference to what we conceive would be a full life might answer that, that question. Uh, my, uh, uh, and I'm going to speak a little bit about the criticism and particularly what I learned this year. You know, I traveled around and I spoke in a lot of places and I got a lot of reactions and some of it was rather interesting. In a way, uh, this, is a, this is a year when I have had over 15,000 letters, uh, but my one of my favorites is uh, Professor Bloom. I am 13 years old, and I hate you. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, and that, in some sense, uh, you know, is a kind of resume. Uh, but I want to tell you about the characteristic questions I was asked by young people. The first one, and always the first one, and you, really universally, was, what do you know about it? Now, I mean, the answer is, and I, I answered honestly, nothing. I mean, I, I can't consider myself a great rock maven, you know, the, uh, but, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, I, uh, but, you know, I, I have looked, I have listened, I became aware of this. You know, not by some kind of artificial, uh, uh, you know, injection, or even by watching my own, but uh, filtered through uh, what students had said to me. It takes me a long time to observe things, and it uh, it, it was only through students that I did become aware of this. But the question, "What do you know about it?" has a very specific meaning uh, in all of them. If you push it further, and that is, no adult can understand this. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it is a youth culture, something superior, and any grown-up, and it's, this begins particularly with their parents, you know, who make criticisms, 
could not know about it. This is a world of ultimate significance. Now, children have always had worlds of significance of their own, but they were very rarely given the right to have it by adults. Uh, and adults were very rarely intimidated by it. Uh, the, and you can say that is, I think, the beginning, the, you can say the circumambient sentiment uh, about uh, the, the music. This is ours. There is no ray from the outside. The next questions, or, uh, the, or the next statements, and the, the, this is fairly universal, is it's not so what you say. And then, usually after a 10-second pause, so what? Uh, uh, the, uh, what if it is true? What's so bad about that? Uh, the, on the one hand, a certain defensiveness, but on the other, a kind of defiant, we cannot question this. It is, you know, this whole, uh, this, this entire mood has something to do with notions of rights. The students who ask you, uh, you know, and the, this, this, uh, the, the, this almost illness of continuous discussion of rights, you know, students are always saying, or young people, don't I have a right to take drugs? And I said, or is, sure, let's say you have a right, but is that the way any sensible person thinks about things? Uh, uh, it, it, it isn't the issue. Uh, you know, whether you ought to, isn't there some way of thinking about this that isn't exhausted by saying, I've got a right. Uh, the, uh, and the, 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 you, know, you, you, you can say that, I, I wasn't going to say minority, but that American group which has most sort of imbibed the, um, the atmosphere of rights argumentation are youngsters. We have rights without you know, thinking about what rights might be, nor about the human content behind the exercise of rights. Uh, the, and also that, so what's the, uh, you know, don't I have a right, so what, or what's so bad about that, is a mixture of a kind of democratic self-satisfaction. We live well, we live fully. This is the satisfaction of the youth and the element of shame, which is characteristic not only of youth, but perhaps of every serious human being who knows his imperfection, is somehow banished. That's a certain tendency of democratic society. Uh, and connected with that, of course, is always the arguments about relativism. You know, this is my kick, you've got your kick. I mean, which is in some sense just a means, not of you know, serious reflection about what the human condition of taste is, but uh, is a mode of preventing criticism. So that one or another way of saying is a, a mode of not having to render accounts about oneself. There are no accounts to be given. You can say the most classic mode of self-evaluation, self-criticism, that one has to explain oneself, and particularly including one's you know, tastes, uh, disappears, uh, and disappears on a high moral ground, uh, 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 high moral intellectual ground relativism. The other a question, uh, or the, the other accusations which uh, you know, go along with this. I mean, it's almost always the case. What do you know about it? It's not so. So what? You know, the half admission, it is so, but then what's going to happen if I do admit it so? Uh, the, uh, you generalize. That's always the big thing, and I've heard that from the dean of Harvard College also. You generalize, as though one could even speak without generalizing. Uh, as the whole generalization isn't the mode of human understanding. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, one has to be careful, of course. One has to look for exceptions, but one has to begin by embracing things after experiencing them in some kind of categories. Otherwise, all explanation disappears. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, Generalization, I'll come to this in just a moment, is of course at the core of reason. All speech generalizes, of course, when you say the word human being. You're, it's a kind of generalization. 
uh, without which we couldn't understand what distinguishes you from your seats, uh, the, uh, and is, uh, you know, is a part of the movement of our reason that, that, that we have to take very seriously indeed. The second is you generalize, and in the second place, you explain, you give causes for our behavior. We are autonomous, self-caused. Uh, the uh, the and, and uh, the, the, this form of you know, self-indulgent vanity is very regular, not only among young people, but it is very characteristic of our times. Now, the you can say the reason for both of these, and it has something to do with the general attack on reason, uh, the uh, which has a political. Uh, element today, and you're finding, of course, throughout the humanities, not only in music, but the. Uh, but in the name of my unique self, uh, they all are unique. Therefore, to explain them would be to defile them. The question, you know, know thyself, which means, for Socrates, know what man is, is an insult because there is no man, there is just little Johnny Jones uh, with his Walkman. Uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, and, and, you know, and my characteristic response to this is, uh, <laughs> it's so, uh, it really is amazing. We have a nation of such extraordinary individualists and you all say the same thing. Uh, the, uh, it is, uh, you know, a kind of, banal uh, commonality that is uh, that or commonplaceness that characterizes the self-expression concerning this. If you ask students, and I have a fair amount this last year, uh, what about rock? What is it that moves you? They say it goes to my feelings. Uh, to the it deep inside, uh, unawares this entire argument, this entire musical culture is a kind of Trojan horse that carries inside it the notion that the deepest in man is his passion or his feeling, not his reason. Now, I know that that's arguable and lots of us feel otherwise at times, but of course we're very grateful for reason when real fanaticism is afoot in the world. Uh, we're also very grateful for reason when we enjoy the fruits of it. Uh, well, the question is whether the deep, I mean, it's a real question, is the deepest in man his expressivity, his sentiments, or is it that which tries to judge among them, it, that which consciously uh, tries to uh, grasp the whole? Uh, this is an issue, but my argument is that it is settled in a kind of modern ideology which is anti-Western, and then you immediately, I mean, anti-rational, and you immediately start hearing these words, and they come from very young kids frequently. You know, I'm tired of your phallocentrism, your logocentrism, your eurocentrism. The, this is the great new thing, opening out beyond. Uh, without, I believe, knowing in any serious sense what that would mean. Uh, the, uh, uh, I will say a little bit more about this later, but the, uh, the seriousness with which one would have to take a world in which you had to abandon rational human rights, uh, the rationally determined, uh, we hold these truths self, uh, to, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, you know life, liberty, and the pursuit of property or pursuit of happiness. Uh, the, uh, this is all logocentric, Eurocentric stuff. And uh, the, uh, uh, like it or not. And, uh, the, uh, and this is part of a general disposition without recognizing the gravity of that, which is carried in this atmosphere, a general disposition to reject reason and hence, you know, our common heritage. Uh, th this anti-rationalism can be seen very easily. I've watched in recent times, a little bit this summer, I was in France, they now 
<laughs> Chicago doesn't have the cable, so I can't watch MTV, but in Paris, late at night, uh, they play these things. It's, <laughs> the French are very, are very uh, uh, uncomprehending of the real rock culture. Uh, the, uh, their, their own French videos are just straight porn, yeah, but uh, the, uh, uh, they, they just can't catch on, yeah. Uh, the, uh, but uh, the, the American and the English ones, uh, what is most striking about them, of course, is their inconsequentiality in that sense of no coherence, you know, the, uh, you know somehow fitting at least, you know, the, the, the screen, you know, sort of great TV screen, which is supposed to be free association, the unconscious, and so on, hostile to that unifying and ordering force that art used to be and reason always is. Now, those are the kinds of things I saw in the student reactions. Uh, now, I'd like to go uh, to a little discussion of the, uh, of the most noticeable critics and perhaps the most serious. I'm going to take three. One, of course, appeared in Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, by an elderly, meaning to say, I think close to my age, a journalist named William Grider, uh, famous for the Stockman interviews. Uh, and the Rolling Stone reaction was a little like what I was used to when I watched The Untouchables, <laughs> the uh, mafia response to, uh, to uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, now I've forgotten his name, who is the... Uh, yeah, Elliot Ness's charges. Yeah, uh, 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 Mr. Grider is a really very nasty piece of goods. I mean, unlike the others, I, the uh, just simple hate, anger. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> of course he goes to the usual, you know, mode of response. Uh, today, young people actually do it. I won't have to interpret that for you. Uh, uh, and, and it seems to drive the 56-year-old Bloom crazy. And no doubt wrinkles many others from his generation. Underneath an ostensibly moral concern, many parents feel a strong current of jealousy as they observe their children exploring realms forbidden to them in their younger years. So you see, uh, repression envy, uh, uh, sexual attraction, as he implies in, uh, later in the article, to these rock stars uh, you know, who, who are for, forbidden to be. And this is all possible, of course. I mean, and how well does uh, any man know himself? But uh, uh, the, uh, 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 it's, uh, the, but the, the, I mean, it seems to me just as ridiculous, you know, to, to think, uh, that nobody was doing it <laughs> beforehand. It's a very characteristic. Uh, I mean, today when I teach Rousseau, uh, for example, students simply cannot believe that he lived out of wedlock with a woman in the 18th century. They thought that was done first by their older brothers. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, you know the great pioneers. Uh, the uh, the. Uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the notion that it might, a man like Stendhal, who is very rarely accused of being repressed, uh, in the great passages and on love where he compares Don Giovanni, who of course wasn't just your ordinary kid rolling around in the hay, uh, to Werther and, and, and much prefers Werther with some kind of serious argument about that for you know the, the pleasures it gives and so on that one might feel pity towards this you know infantile sexuality simply was uh, uh, unknown. Now the next one, uh, uh, the next uh, quote, which is I don't know, the reason why I'm uh, quoting from Grider, uh, is this in his uh, in his response to me. Uh, you know, which is, I think, in general, just simply vicious, uh, without you know, without redeeming intellectual merit. And uh, but uh, uh, he he gives a description which seems to me just about right. 
The smart young people I know today have a brainy hipness that people like Bloom can't handle. I don't agree with that. Uh, I know a young woman from Yale who manages to read Hegel while simultaneously watching Wheel of Fortune. Uh, a, uh, a junior at Princeton who is absorbed by the Old Testament but also hooked on Opera Winfrey. If I suggested to these young people that they were searching for the good, the true, and the beautiful, they would laugh. They study philosophy, they would say, only because it is a challenging mind game. If Plato nourishes the soul, so does Vanna White. In a way, that's self, uh, self uh, commentating. I mean, I don't need to make any statements about this, that in some sense, I think this is the view uh, of what serious education would be. Uh, the, uh, but the, the, the degree to which the, or the kind of human effect, I mean, the, I doubt really if it's possible to read Hegel while watching Wheel of Fortune, to read Hegel. Uh, and, but the important thing is if afterwards Vanna White and Plato uh, uh, are equal contenders in the mind of somebody, something has gone radically wrong. <laughs> Uh, the, and I think that can be seen by everybody. Uh, and that, but of course, this is a kind of consequence of this popular relativism that is my uh, great target in in the book. Uh, the uh, uh, the um, one can say that it is the greatest danger to democracy while being a tendency of democracy. Somehow the equality of man seems to demand, although it does not necessarily do so. It did not for the founding fathers or for, for, uh, for uh, supporters of democracy like Tocqueville, that all thoughts be understood to be equal. Uh, the, uh, the, and, and this is it in its full form. Uh, the, and uh, as I say, I couldn't uh, have given much better a description of this uh, phenomenon and he has given in praising it of the soul without longing. Uh, the, uh, now that is a, uh, uh, I wanted to turn to a more serious and more respectful review which was in the New York Times by John Perales. I think that's the way it's pronounced, I'm sorry, or that's the way it reads, I don't know if that's the way it's pronounced. Uh, the, uh, who begins by saying, Mr. Bloom contends, well, it doesn't begin, I'm choosing selections, obviously. Uh, Mr. Bloom contends that the gratification provided by rock quotes, ruins the imagination of young people, short-circuiting their appreciation for noble art and literature. Uh, the, 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 uh, that's his, the short-circuiting, not mine. It's hard to argue empirically about the imagination, but it's worth noting that most of the West's cultural tethers were originally created for aristocratic rather than mass tastes. Now the implication, which he doesn't draw, this is a kind of enthymeme, he just takes it for granted, that therefore we can't have that kind of art, that uh, we shouldn't even aspire to it, that uh, it wouldn't be a problem for democracy if most of the great works of art were for aristocracies and therefore would, for, would find difficult uh, roots, uh, would find it difficult to take root in a democracy. Uh, if that is true, then uh, well, you would have one of two choices. Uh, the older choice, which was that, uh, the choice, I believe, of the founders and of others, that we needed universities to preserve the highest tastes for the good of everyone, but with some recognition that there are higher tastes and that they would have some difficulty. Or the other is simply to, in this easy relativism, to forget the rank order of things and uh, what, what a loss that might be. But uh, my argument, of course, about conformism, the conformism of this music is, of course, it is, uh, it is conformism to the reigning radical egalitarianism of this democracy. You don't even have to make an argument. I mean, certain ki other kinds of American writers, 
take a very snobbish version of one I wouldn't say. Eliot, of course, made the same observation and, of course, left the country. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, and that this has lost its problematic status, and I believe it has. I don't think this is just this author. Um, and then he goes on to say, Mr. Bloom has found the right adversary. Popular music in many more denominations than Mr. Bloom seems aware of, doubtless inspires many of his students and stirs their passionate involvement as he wishes philosophy would. This is not new or dreadful, or, or this is not a new or dreadful role for music, which has from time immemorial been connected with ritual. I should stop with that word ritual, you know, another one of the hot terminology, uh, you know, terms these days, or sets of terms, terminology, has to do with the new discovery of the sacred and of myths and rites and so on. Uh, and uh, the uh, kind of admiration for that, admiration that, that, uh, for that against the kind of enlightenment criticism was made of it, and an attempt to attach a rock music to that kind of uh, expression of the passions. Uh, but as soon as you say the word ritual, you think of what it took to found religions, because rituals mean gods and the elevations that gods were connected with. And you'll see the problem about rock music. It may indeed preempt part of the area where religious sentiment once lived, but it is not itself religious sentiment. Uh, the, uh, to, uh, quote Senator Benson, you are no religion. Uh, the, uh, uh, good to continue. Rock embodies many of the ideas that concern Mr. Bloom. He takes issue with cultural relativism, uh, the idea that different cultures should be judged by different standards. That's not, uh, of course, what I said, but historicism, notion that ideas reflect their times. Modernist skepticism and the substitution of feelings or commitment for reason. Those watered-down ideas from modern philosophy, he believes, have robbed American students of a sense of purpose. Mr. Bloom adv advocates rationalist thought, which he considers natural and respects the monuments of European culture crowned by philosophy. Rock and jazz, like other 20th century American art, can't help but make the old hierarchy look provincial, he says. I think that's true, in exactly the same way McDonald's makes French cooking look provincial. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, whether the experience of soul soul in Plato are completely rendered uh, uh, parochial and narrow by Mick Jagger is a question worthy of study, of course. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, these new arts revel in the moment and are shaped by passion. And there's a good deal in the 20th century which reveled in the moment and is shaped by passion, or was shaped by passion, and one wonders whether that's simply unquestionably good. What listenable music isn't? They laugh off Eurocentrism. Here it comes. And this is part of it. And overturn elitism. Historically and tech, uh, technologically, it's too late for Eurocentrism. And this is part of the ordinary can In what sense is it technologically too late for Eurocentrism? All science in the world is European or Western science and Western technology, and that hasn't changed. And this is just the moment when it has become most dominant. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, and, and his argument, uh, as he puts it, standards and canons should be applied, but they have to be appropriate ones. He doesn't tell how this is done, by the way, but includes, I don't demand bel canto from Prince any more than I expect Frank from Placido Domingo. Uh, I would doubt very much uh, whether, uh, of course, standards have to be uh, have to be appropriate. I mean, one would not apply the same standards to sitcom that one would to classical tragedy, Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus, and Shakespeare. Uh, that goes without saying. Uh, I understand that. But the way in which one judges this, and there is a certain judgment, is what those things do for a human soul, or for the, if we like, modern 
lingo better for the development of a self, whether there is not a difference between the level of the sitcom and the level of the grand tragedy, not to say that one you know, wouldn't amuse oneself in one or the other, but that one has to think, and that is the standard, of course, the human effect. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, what uh, um, the Times critic, what Perales suggests, is uh, that we have combined many cultures, that we have thrown over our old ethnocentrism or Eurocentrism. Uh, this is part of you know, you know, contemporary radical language. I, I'm not, that doesn't mean to say that he himself is a radical. It's now so common. But the, uh, the, uh, the question is, has it done anything else but provide a superficial and false cosmopolitanism where one doesn't take seriously the charms and the temptations of truly different cultures? Where do we really allow and admire any longer, you know, the joys of sacrificing human beings to one's God? Uh, where you know, do we really approve of the harem anymore? Uh, where do we really approve of slavery and religions which celebrate it? We have conspired to avoid facing what real cultural difference means, presenting a kind of domesticated set of different cultures, but all of which will go along with America. But we don't realize that in undermining the principles that support American equality and American openness, we might be on the edge of being able to experience those horrors, or some of those horrors, or some of those, you might say, new experiences of other cultures. Uh, the uh, the uh, this is the kind of issue, this is the, the question is, is this the representation of an easygoing cosmopolitanism uh, which really gives no larger goals and allows for self-satisfaction in a technological commercial era, or is it a real inspiration of the soul? Is this a narrow group of youngsters who have no experience of life who are producing this under the influence of and while influencing certain commercial interests? Now this leads me to turn to the big name that attacked me, uh, Frank Zappa, who's a well-known. <laughs> You know, zapped by Zappa, yeah, it would be the, uh, the uh, uh, Zappa's criticism is extremely interesting in that it's mixed up, tormented, right, really incoherent. No, I, I mean this seriously, I mean I'm not, uh, no, this is really not a joke. What I need to say is the others are producing a kind of prepared pap. But uh, he has some problems. Uh, and that comes out in what is meant to be an attack on me. Now, he begins, you know, with the usual thing. Anybody who's against rock must be allied with Jerry Falwell. Because what other reason could one be critical of this? I mean, it is that strange status of rock. Everybody... Uh, criticizes and despises television. That's universal. You never meet anybody. But another aspect of popular culture, rock music, you can't criticize at all. And why that should be the case, I mean, it's somewhat mysterious to me. Uh, uh, you know, why, why one aspect of, 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 of popular culture should be considered to be uh, 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 the source of all Ill ills and another completely exempt from decent criticism. Uh, the, uh, the, that anybody, uh, that there could be a standpoint other than some kind of religious fundamentalism 
uh, and you know, a desire to you know tear the Wachman off uh, uh, to uh, start censorship you know and take us back to the New England township you know and uh, you know, ghosts and witches and so on I think if you read my text carefully you won't find any indication of any of that uh, uh, the uh, the I mean I certainly don't suggest censorship of uh, uh, of any kind I think that this is a relatively vulgar phenomenon. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean I'm in cahoots with Falwell, uh, the new criteria, you know. Uh, <laughs> any possible sinister organization, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, but, uh, but uh, that kind of identity, I mean, the, the, the Falwell thing comes up like over and over again. And there's another. Uh, you know, and of course you're supposed to be frightened off against that. I mean, that's you know, that's the Middle Ages, whatever. Uh, the uh, you know, you know the, the, these kind of words like you know, the, the, that uh, in the paralysis, uh, or you know, well, that wasn't democratic. <coughs> so we have to have a democratic art. Similarly, um, if there would be any religious moralism involved, now I believe, by the way, there is a serious. Uh, a criticism that can be made from the point of view of morality. That is just not the perspective which I adopt in my criticism, but it cannot be understood as anything else but that. Uh, the, uh, the other suggestion, which is even nastier, is that anybody who doesn't like rock is a racist. And he makes that charge, of course, because there's an alleged connection with black music. And if you, you know, don't accept this music, then you uh, you 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 deny the black uh, political, uh, excuse me, the black uh, cultural contribution to the American community, and so on. Which I say is just a lot of nonsense, and is a way, of course, since racism is something one wants to avoid, uh, a way of assuring conformism on this issue. But once he gets past all of that, uh, you know, which is kind of ritual, you know, it's a kind of incantation that you can expect when the, the, this is touched, one finds that he agrees with me in very large measure. He says, sure, this is ugly. What do you expect it to be? Beautiful? When you live in a country that is a mess run by criminals. And, and he concludes the article again saying this is the fault of Reagan who he identifies with this criminality. Uh, now, th this is really rather interesting. Uh, I really think my argument is rather loose. You know, it's not written with moral, I mean loose, not in the sense of <laughs> loose argument, but uh, 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 in the sense of stay loose, you know, as opposed to being uptight. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, and the, but these people play the loose, you know, the, uh, the really easy going and, you know, but penetrated with moral indignation, anger and rage at a criminal country, uh, and, uh, you know, which is, of course, impossible, but the notion that this is the worst time in the history of all mankind. Therefore, we can't have beautiful art. Beautiful art was, you know, in the time of the Inquisition, you know. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the notion that under the most unfavorable circumstances, like the Reagan administration, you know, that man can imagine facing, uh, uh, that art must try to provide the beautiful and the sublime for man to discover what is beautiful about human life. It is, you know, his statement, you know, is very impressive in that respect. I'm first admitting the ugliness and then giving a kind of excuse that this is what art must do, it must show the ugliness, without any description of its being redemptive uh, in that way. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, we tell it like it is. Uh, so there is this strange mixture of looseness, and this in all senses, looseness of argumentation, looseness in morals and staying loose. He says, there's no standard of taste in any of this. This is just my pleasure. Uh, and it's, it just so happens that other people like my pleasure and we get paid for it, so that's all pretty nice. And I don't like television all that much and I like making music. Now, it's perfectly clear he cannot mean this as nobody ever really seriously means relativism. 
you know, that, that he thinks that television is better when what he does, or as, as good as. He is making a kind of argument which he can't face and take in. I mean, there's no reason why he should, except that he, you know, presents himself as the intellectual voice of rock music, testifies before Congress, things I never do. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and it is this combination of uh, moral indignation, helplessness of the arts, and he says, of course, this is ugly, rotten stuff. On the one hand, it, because it reflects our times, but also, he says, because this is what the commercial people make it into. It becomes an attack on capitalism, an attack on commerce. Never once possibility attack on popular taste. That that commerce can't simply make popular taste. In my article, of course, I say that this is an art, you know, a kind of conspiracy between uh, strange young men and, you know, very hip adults uh, who know how to, you know, mine gold from rock. I say that with great clarity. But, the, but it is a kind of, you know, this can be the only explanation. And the fact that he does this for money, although he could probably suffer a little bit, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, produce his work. But that, 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 that kind of inevitability, a kind of economic determinism in what is clearly undetermined. Now, uh, the, uh, here I will give the quote, uh, the, uh, I actually brought this article, uh, the, uh, he, first there's a quote from me to which he responds, to Plato and Nietzsche, this is me, the history of music is a series of attempts to give form and beauty to the dark, chaotic, premonitory forces in the soul, to make them serve a higher purpose, an ideal, to give man's duties a fullness. And then he comments, this is a man who has fallen for Rock's fabricated image of itself. This is the worst kind of ivory tower intellectualism. You know, you've got to be, uh, you know, these people have adopted some of the language of capitalists, you know, uh, professors, you know, where they, they, they never met a payroll or, uh, you know, uh, played a bass. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, this is the worst kind of ivory tower intellectualism. Anybody who talks about dark forces is right on the fringe of mumbo jumbo. Dark forces, what is this? Another product from Lucasfilm? The passions. When was the last time you saw an American exhibit any form of passion? Now, you know, those remarks were made about music in general, not about this music. I was not a child of this music or, you know, particularly taken in by it. But he agrees with my general thesis that, you know, passion has been somehow, real passion has been removed by this. And he won't make the argument for it. Uh, the, uh, then, another quote from me, he says, rock music has risen to its current heights in the education of the young on the ashes of classical music and in an atmosphere in which there is no intellectual resist resistance to attempts to tap the rawest passions. Cultivation of the soul uses the passions and satisfies them while sublimating them and giving them an artistic unity. Bach's religious intentions and Beethoven's revolutionary and humane ones are clear enough examples of what I mean. And then he says, this is nonsense. And he goes on to explain why, what is classical music. Classical music is the same as rock music. Uh, they too had patrons, and they had to write what their patrons told them. Uh, and their, their patrons determined what would be successful and not successful. Uh, therefore, and uh, this, by the way, is the reflection of exactly, I mean, of course, he got it from there. I mean, his mind is not exactly free of other people's sewage. Uh, the, uh, uh, from what's going on in the university days and talking about the canon, you know, and the canon which is determined by some strange group of people and therefore dominates all universities and so on, this, this kind of talk. And that the, the classic is only what happens to have been made classical, or the canon is only what has been canonized. No inner content whatsoever. This is what he has to say about music, and presumably all music, that it is only on the grounds of the economic determination, not that a musician could educate an age, or that he might use the conventions of an age to transcend it, or that there is some serious intention uh, of a moral, political order 
in, uh, in many great musicians. Uh, but that, 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 that this is, uh, you know, as I say, I mean, I'm, I'm quite certain he doesn't think about what he says or what he means here. It's adopted. Uh, and then it is repetition. The classic comes from repetition. The question is whether it's repeated because it's classic or it's classic because it's repeated. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the then uh, 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 he quotes me: "The family spiritual void has left the field open to rock music. The result is nothing less than the parents' loss of control of their children's moral education at a time when no one else is seriously concerned with it. This spinach has been achieved by an alliance between a strange young males, I mentioned that, <coughs> the gift of divining the mobs, emergent wishes, wishes and the rock, rock company executives. There is some truth to that, but how do we get to this point, and what do we do about it? Uh, we got here because of teenagers, because teenagers are the most sought after consumers. The whole idea of merchandising the prepubescent masturbational fantasy, that's a quote from me, uh, 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 is not necessarily the work of the songwriters. But you see, he says that's what, of course, they're doing. Uh, you know, he, unlike those, oh, no, 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 this was the end of the Vietnam War, to stop hunger in Africa, the, uh, the, he says this is the way it is. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, but again, says it's purely economic, and well, maybe it is, but that doesn't change the truth of this description. Classical music is dead among the young, this quote for me. Rock music is as unquestioned, unproblematic as the air students breathe, and very few have any acquaintance at all with classical music. Classical music is now a special taste, like Greek language or pre-Columbian archaeology, not a common culture of reciprocal communication and psychological shorthand. On this point, Bloom and I can, are, I can agree, he says. But how can a child be blamed for consuming only that which is presented to him? I didn't blame the children. I only described them. Uh, the, uh, he's doing the presenting. Uh, and the argument that this is simply beyond the powers is a form of resignation, which, uh, again, Tocqueville says, would be characteristic of um, uh, would be characteristic of democracy, uh, forces which are too powerful which, uh, for individuals to master, a kind of sense of weakness. In an age of individualism, the individual does not still feel strong enough to rule or to change. I, I mention these not, of course, because I regard them as uh, very profound formulas, but to give you something of the atmosphere stated in relation to this book of the rock world. Now, I'd like to say a few words about the kind of perspective I was taking. It was a perspective drawn from a philosophy. I am not a philosopher, but it is very helpful for us to look to philosophers to get to those heights on, from which we can judge ourselves, which we are likely to forget in the uh, in the push of common culture. Uh, I, uh, uh, I have a favorite passage from Rousseau. Uh, one thing I discovered, uh, you know, it takes time. I mean, it's not a great discovery. It's right there on the surface, but uh, we don't pay attention to it until it becomes relevant. How important for Plato, Aristotle, Rousseau, Hegel, Nietzsche, music is, as central to education, as most indicative of many things about the soul of man and its barbarism and its civilization and so on, that the, this was somehow is center partly to the central of the philosophic enterprise of understanding man, but also to educating him. Uh, now, there's a passage which is very dear to me, uh, which is in Rousseau's musical dictionary. Rousseau devoted a huge amount of his uh, writing to music, and he has a dictionary, which is, and under the heading of genius, he writes the following. Don't try, young artists, to define genius. If you have it, you will feel it in yourself. If you don't, you will never know it. Uh, the musician's genius subjects the whole universe to his art, paints all pictures by sounds. It makes even silence speak. Uh, 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 
uh, it, uh, it turns ideas into sentiments and sentiments into accents. And it excites the passions it expresses in the depths of hearts. Voluptuousness through it gains new charms. The pain it awakes causes screams. It burns ceaselessly but is never consumed. It hotly expresses glaciers. Even in depicting the horrors of death, it brings to the soul that sentiment of life which never leaves it, which it communicates to hearts made to feel it. But alas, it can say nothing to those uh, where its germ does not exist. And its prodigies are hardly noticeable to those who cannot imitate them. If you listen to Pergolesi, this was a favorite uh, uh, of Rousseau's he, uh, in his quarrel with French music. Uh, if you listen to per Pergolesi and your eyes fill with tears, if you feel your heart palpitating, if you tremble, if your breath is taken away in your ecstasies, uh, 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 his genius, Pergolesi's that is, will warm you and you will create through his example. But if you experience neither delirium nor delight, uh, if, you, uh, 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 if you find beautiful only that which overwhelms, do you dare to ask what genius is? Vulgar man, don't profane, profane the, uh, the sublime word. Go write French music. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, this was a passage which was uh, pointed out first to me in a book of Karl Barth, uh, uh, the, the great, perhaps the greatest Christian the theologian of this century, uh, who said that, that, that this was the statement which in a way formed, certainly expressed the taste of the romanticism which, to which Rousseau gave the first impulse. And you can see the level of experience the level of what a music is supposed to do, uh, the, uh, and that, the, that in some measure the music that was created in this atmosphere of foreboding spiritual pregnancy, if one likes, uh, uh, is a, an extraordinary resource for knowing what the power and the range of human capacity, the capacity of the soul. I, you know, I don't want to use it as mumbo jumbo, it doesn't mean anything to you, but when you talk about these kinds of sentiments, you can't talk about body. Uh, you'll have to find some other word, but uh, the soul will stand as shorthand of that irreducible part of man. Uh, the, uh, now, the, the, this kind of reflection was characteristic of all the ancient philosophers and of all, or the most significant of the modern philosophers since uh, Rousseau. It was indeed forgotten, or if not forgotten, in some sense it's suppressed or explained away in those modern philosophies, as philosophers, Hobbes, Locke, Montesquieu, uh, Voltaire, who lay at the root of much of liberal democracy, that in some sense that part of the soul was left uneducated uh, in perhaps the excessive expectations from reason. This would be the kind of reflection any of us who were to think about music and the role of music in modern life. There seems to be no doubt that all kinds of music, high romantic musical, and it, uh, music and its ecstasies and rock, in some sense are a reaction to that, for forgetting that you can say, if you want to use their language, that the capitalist world is unmusical and that it needs a kind of supplement, but one which sits very uneasily with it. Uh, I am going to have to quit. Uh, the, uh, you know, you can always leave, you know. Uh, 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 I, the, uh, you, know you know, one nice thing is I never compel. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to quit because of the time, not because of any, you know, uh, any contestatarian tastes. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the education of taste, uh, I suspect he's not leaving because he's going to ask a question. What do you think? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the question of taste, which is, of course, the formation, uh, the education of pleasure and pain. 
which of course is, uh, and taste is a tissue of judgments. And good taste means to say to have you know, the greatest sensitivities, the capacity to compare you know, all the kinds of human sentiments and aspirations. The, uh, it is much more important in daily life than is morals or is moral philosophy and is largely determinative of because the character of one's taste, if it is completely opposed to the character of one's moral duties, will always undermine them. Uh, the delicacy of the soul as well as its uh, intensity are largely determined. Now, I wanted to say, as my say, last words about this, uh, the, uh, I mean, there, is, there are more things I can say, and perhaps they will come out in the discussion period, I mean, much more than I can say. Um, I prepared something that was somewhat too long. But that, so far as sex goes, it is obviously one of the, the most important of the passions. And of course, all good art, musical and otherwise, has to appeal to the passions. I mean, music is not sermons. Music is not uh, you know, for, uh, the orations of one's masters. Uh, the music and art is, has to begin by the pleasures, has to move the passions, otherwise it is enforced and loses its nature. So it has to begin with the passions, but it's supposed in turn to, uh, to educate the passions. There are certain passions that are very easy to touch. Times of war, patriotic, angry passions are very easy to touch. The easiest passion of all to touch, and Rousseau said this in some sense, tried to do it himself, is the sexual passion. Uh, the, particularly in times when patriotism and religious belief are not very high. Uh, the, and youngsters have very powerful and unrefined sexual passions after puberty. That is the great moment. Rousseau, in what was a classic, I mean classic for the whole 19th, I think early 20th century, spends a long time on the education of that age. He developed the notion of what we mean by sublimation. Sublimation meaning to say not repression, which is what we identify it with, but with the sublime with the elevation of the human soul. This is where the energy comes from, and that, that this is the critical moment in life, that it doesn't come then, it will never come, that it's possible to waste those energies or not to attach them to the higher things to which art is capable of leading it. Uh, it is my argument, and it was that this argument appeals to the, that, that this music appeals to the raw, undeveloped sexual taste because that sells. Uh, I would say, and it's on this that I will end, I want to read, you know, a classic quote I'm sure you all know, uh, but uh, somehow uh, I felt moved to read it again and to bring it to you tonight, the famous quote from, on music from the Merchant of Venice, that if we do not somehow think about music in this cosmic way, uh, we will lose that stored up heritage of spiritual development which makes any kind of decent civilization. Uh, it, it is in the fifth book, or excuse me, the fifth uh, act of The Merchant of Venice, very ugly play where opposing cultures or religions have ugly confrontation, Jew and Christian, uh, Shylock and Antonio, and it ends, it ends without, uh, at the end of Act Four, without any resolution. But Act Five presents a kind of re resolution which is not a resolution of the mixing of cultures or taking away their character or denying this ugliness, but a kind of transcendence uh, in the beautiful uh, uh, castle of Portia. And uh, the young Jewess, uh, Jessica, who has left her father cruelly, not really to move to a Christian world, but to move to a world of love beyond those things, sits with her lover, Lorenzo, and says, how sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness in the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Sit, Jessica. Look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with patterns of bright, of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb 
which thou beholdst, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubins. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. Let me repeat that. But whilst this muddy vesture of decay, the body, doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. And enter the musicians. Come ho, and wake Diana with a hymn, with sweetest touches, pierce your mistress's ears, and draw her home with music. Jessica, I'm, I am never merry when I hear sweet music. Lorenzo, the reason is, your spirits are attentive. For but note, a wild and wanton herd, or race of youthful and unhandled colts, fetching mad bounds, bellowing and neighing loud, which is the hot condition of their blood. If they but hear perchance a trumpet sound or any air of music through their ears, you shall perceive them make a mutual stand, their savage eyes turn to a modest gaze by the sweet power of music. Therefore the poet did feign that Orpheus drew trees, stones, and floods, since not so stockish, hard, and full of rage, but music for the time doth change his nature. The man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treason, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. Let no such man be trusted. Mark the music. I think it would be very nice if Professor Bloom and I would spend a very few minutes discussing some issues that uh, have occurred to me and that, that might have arisen out of what he's had to say. And then I'd like to ask for some questions from the audience, which we will take in a little different uh, fashion from the way they're usually done at the Y, instead of having cards uh, where the questions can be uh, vetted. <laughs> before they're made public, uh, we'll, I will just ask the questioner to stand up and scream, and then we'll see what happens. I wanted to say that, um, first, that there were three things that you said that uh, seemed important to me. I'm teasing you a little now. Two of them are things that no one will believe you about, and the third one is one that I won't believe you about. Uh, you said that with what you say, uh, you were accused, but it's not really true, of being in league with Jerry Falwell or the rather different new criterion. I don't think anybody's going to believe you The new you criterion about what didn't that. come up. I uh, just couldn't resist now, it looking at your... The thing that I won't believe that you said is when you said you were not a philosopher. Because, as I understand it, a philosopher uses reason to understand the world, and I think that is what you do, and you do in a very important way for our time. I also want to say, and I think it does throw some light on what you were talking about, that when you quoted uh, the article from the New York Times, where the critics said that he didn't demand bel canto from Prince or Funk from Placido Domingo, uh, surely the problem is that because of prints or because of that kind of thing, a situation has arisen in which we can't even demand bel canto from Placido Domingo. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the, that's the, I was claiming I my, saw claiming my rights as a music <laughs> critic here. Um, Alan, let me start this off by quoting your words to you quickly and then asking a question about it. You've written in the closing of The American Mind, and I quote, one of the strange aspects of my relations with good students I come to know well is that I frequently introduce them to Mozart. This is a pleasure for me in as much as it is always pleasant to give people gifts that please them. Now, I'd like to ask you, 
Are you saying here that Mozart, or music like Mozart, has a special and proper place, not just in education about music, but at the core of liberal education itself? In other words, what's the role of the arts, the high arts, in liberal education? Yeah, that, uh, that puts me in the role of curricular advisor, and I'm never really sure. I mean, I, I have a certain horror of the well-balanced man, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of artificial picture, you know, that if you don't have music or if you don't have painting, uh, the, uh, you, uh, uh, you won't, you can't possibly be, you know, a a human being who understands. I, mean, I think that in some sense a fully comprehensive intellect would understand those various ways to understand or to see the nature of things. But uh, most people you know, are kind of crippled and the best we can do is to use those devices we have and that there would be something kind of false in turning out a perfect kid. You know, who, you know I mean, I have I'm really horrified by the attempts, you know, to educate kids right, you know, as against the common toe, because it usually turns out very artificially. Uh, and so my understanding of a good uh, education would be, of course, where in the largest measure they are reading and writing, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, but of course uh, there has to be a background where they learn these things, where they play instruments. I mean, you know, Rousseau in his description of an education gives just that point when they're eight or nine. You know, uh, when their voices are such that they can tie that in with other forms of exercises that, that they do. I mean, I'm in no sense an expert at any of these things. Uh, Obviously, somebody who can't be stirred by music at all, something is absent. Although I've known some very great figures who had all the other kinds of sensibilities sort of compensate for this. It's like somebody who's missing an ear, you know, or an eye or something. The, uh, and, uh, you know, and I've heard criticism, ah, he or she doesn't understand music, you know, or he doesn't understand painting. Uh, that, uh, you know, our purpose is to live good lives and, you know, to have the equipment for understanding. I mean, these are obviously very useful elements, but I'm not sure that one or the other is absolutely necessary. I'm just, that's not an argument for specialization. I'm terribly sorry, but, you know, I'm, I'm rather long about this, but the, uh, the, the important thing is it really has somehow to fit the spirit of the times. That's not historicist, but I mean, if you're, if you're going to begin. I spoke two weeks ago with the headmaster of Winchester School, which is now supposed to be England's best school, and he said, our classics really aren't having much influence anymore because there's such a disproportion with the life outside the, universe, uh, the school, although it's a school that's very serious. Uh, closer to my Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, I spoke to the headmaster of the Winchester School, which is supposed to be the best in England now, in very traditional classical languages and so on. And uh, he said, it is very hard for us to educate anymore because, in a serious way, because there's such a disproportion between what we say is serious and the life outside there, particularly the musical taste he meant, actually. The, uh, uh, that, uh, and they cohere very ill. And I would think one has to make new beginnings on the basis of experience people have. Well, what, what interests me so much here is that you particularly chose Mozart. Uh huh. You chose Mozart because you chose Mozart because of your own response to Mozart. Well, I I respond to lots of things, but the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, that, that's not uh, you, know, you see it's. I mean, there are other things that I like very much, but this has a kind of immediacy with me, and that is very personal. I mean, I think there are many beginning points, just as in all education, the beginning points are infinite. I think the ending points are single, but. Uh, I mean, the, the, the most recent experience was a, quite a bright student, very sort of healthy, normal athlete who, you know, has been studying on a fairly advanced level, had no interest in music except somewhat for rock, and came over to my house one day when I was, when he was let in by the housekeeper and I was in the back room, and, but I had left on Maria Callas singing in the Barber of Seville. When I came back in, he said to me, uh, what is that? Uh, you know, he was obviously jumping, you know, and so uh, I said, it's, uh, 
uh, that's the Barbara, so it was Bill Barbara Cena, that's Mark Collins. And I said, you like that? And, you know, without, and he said, I said, well, then you've got a great future. And then all, you know, I don't try to introduce him to it, but he heard it. And now the last I saw him, it's been two years now. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's really seriously studying music and bah, <laughs> is now his taste and so on. And uh, th those are very, you know, very moving things. And of course, if I had tried, to force him, this you know, this will be good for you. This is edifying. I would never have succeeded. Well, you, you, you've said, and, and I think you're right. Certainly, it's very difficult to go against the spirit of the times. But you've gone against the spirit of the times, and you've sold a hell of a lot of books in doing so. Now's your moment. You know, now's your moment in American life. I, you said you don't see yourself as a curricular advisor. But uh, there was a wonderful saying of the uh, singer Shalyapin, who was rehearsing with the conductor, who was gumming everything up. And Shalyapin started to uh, conduct the orchestra behind the conductor's back. And the conductor turned to him and said, well, am I the conductor or are you the conductor? And Shalyapin said, in a garden where there are no birds, even the cricket is a nightingale. <laughs> so now, now you have, now you're in a position where people listen to you. Yeah. May not like it, a lot of people listen to you. Yeah. So if it's not Mozart, it's Rossini, but... Yeah, I feel like the that, vice presidential candidates, what will I do? <laughs> you're in that world. Well, I'd pray. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, my view is in all of these things. You know, I'm a professor of philosophy, and that the, the the first and most important thing is come to a consciousness of where we're at, the kind of forgettings that have taken place as a result of relativism. That this kind of prop criticism, you know, which in a way now is center stage. I mean, I think you remember when we were young, Time Magazine's uh, music section was mostly classical and very rarely a pop thing. Now, of course, it's the reverse and the real change in American life, uh, you know, of semi-educated American life uh, 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 has, has, uh, has taken place. And uh, my view would be that of course it is very much up to parents so far as the musical taste goes. Uh, but I would certainly not advise parents to try to cut their children off. It's like those who say, you know, I don't have a television, I won't let my children. I mean, usually that produces little monsters. Uh, because, because I, I, I mean, you know, either, you know, falsely superior to their own times or, you know, full of hidden lusts, you know, and disappointment and anger at what they're missing. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, and I would say the same thing about rock music. Uh, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, that, uh, but that uh, I talk about this family spiritual void, and I think that parents are just going to have to pay a hell of a lot more attention to their homes, not in the sense of, you know, keeping the kids good or spanking them, or but of spending time reading with them, but in ways that appeal to them, and looking around for things that appeal to them. You know, I mean, having some private space. I mean, that was, of course, the advantage of a liberal democracy, that you could have very vulgar popular taste, but you have a private life. Private life has largely disappeared as a result of ideology. What I need to say is you're seeing the same things and the same ideas every place. It's very hard to resist the similarity of tastes, very little offered in the way of different uh, Well, I'm uh, interested that thoughts. you say that you wouldn't suggest that parents shut off the television set. I, I didn't say I would, they me. wouldn't shut off the, uh, the, the television set, which they'd have to do sometimes. I wouldn't suggest in general that they not have a television set. If their kids are, I, just as I don't think, you know, my experience as a teacher in the United States is, and that this is very, uh, this is already a very low, low level comparison, but the, the students who go to public schools turn out to be better students than those who go to private schools. Uh, in my years as a, uh, 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 in my years as a teacher, uh, I mean, it's a, maybe it's a hard struggle, but in my years as a graduate teacher, I think I have never had a student, maybe some went to grade school, but, but, but uh, who went to one of the, you know, the Eaton Andover, you know, the uh, uh, never won. And, uh, you know, I've taught in, you know, very good universities, uh, the, uh, that somehow 
coming to grips with and not utterly losing the traces with the, uh, w w with the present life of American <clears throat> democracy is quite important. That may be surprising to you, but I, I simply wanted to correct that notion that there's some kind of goody-good, sterile way of dealing with this. It's a, it's a huge effort in which, of course, the parents are getting no cooperation from the universities because the universities have swallowed this relativism, have swallowed this canonical stuff. There is no place uh, for high culture in this kind of religion of popular culture are we getting, that has swept across the country. Are the parents getting any cooperation from our political leaders? <sighs> They're certainly not getting any encouragement, uh, uh, the, uh, because I, you know, I, I would think, frankly, that it is in something like the universities, what we call the classes who are interested in liberal education, that these things have to be preserved for everybody's good. How do you deal with this charge of elitism. Um, you've dealt with it to my satisfaction just now with your remark about public school graduates against, against private school graduates, but there are a lot of people out there who are going to say, well, how the hell do you know? And even if you do know, what gives you the right to tell anybody else? Oh, sure, I mean, that, that, that in that sense, it's elitist, I mean, that, 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 I mean if, I don't think that any kind of educational institution can exist if it doesn't know what's to be taught. You know, the, you know I mean, if anything should be taught and they have no sense of what's important or useful other than popular demand, let's say, then, you know, they, they should close up. I mean, they, see, most of this anti-elitism, I this, excuse me, this elitism stuff has come from one group. You know, settled here in New York, but mostly Harvard graduates, all Ivy Leagues. And that, you know, I, you know, I've always taught in the Middle West. You know, I'm a real man of the people, as you can see. Uh, uh, the uh, 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 you know, hardly the hayseed off me, and uh, the, uh, and uh, I get this picture. Uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, I went to Harvard, I knocked on the door, and they yelled, uh, I, <laughs> I knocked at the door, and they yelled, there's nobody in here but us anti-elitists. Yeah, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the extraordinary hypocrisy of that, you know, when of course they have these terribly high, you know, admission standards, and they create a kind of uh, meritocratic, bureaucratic, technological elite, and do so without any reserve. It's simply in the humanity. You know, that's all nonsense. So that you can turn over to this pressure for non-Western, for relativism, for, you know, some kind of political, uh, political taste. Now, my view is that those who are serious about liberal education are an oppressed minority. You know, they, they, nobody's working for them, nobody's trying to present anything for them. My view has always been you know, the University of Chicago, in spite of its reputation, was certainly when I was young, didn't get terribly good students because, you know, they all went to Harvard, you know, and it was, uh, the, uh, and it was uh, sort of marginals, people, you know, who, the, the, you know, who didn't succeed terribly well in school, or a few people who had the taste for the, for the odd. Uh, my view is as open as possible, uh, the, uh, but very few people have this taste. And, uh, but, but, and that the university has to enshrine this taste. And I'm not very much, I've never been terribly pushy about standards, except as the result. You know, and to say that I'm willing to wait a long time, let people digest, but it's important, of course, that serious work result. That's the, that's the, so in some sense, obviously, there would be, in my view, in a Jeffersonian way, a kind of natural aristocracy not ruling but which had these tastes and kept this knowledge, which is absolutely essential, say, in the political form. People don't know any longer what are the philosophic grounds of the constitutional system. They simply don't know, and therefore they're incapable of defending it. You know, the, uh, that's very important. You know, you, you know, they may ultimately decide to agree with that, but there is real philosophic thinking behind the Federalists and hence the construction of the U.S. Constitution. We don't know that anymore. It's terribly important for a, for a society which doesn't depend upon religions, revelations, uh, uh, the, the, the rule of priests and so on, which is a democracy, to be conscious of the principles which, which, uh, which animate us. So in that sense, it is a kind of ruling aristocracy. I don't think many people will pursue that. But those who are interested 
must be encouraged and that must be understood to be the most central role of the university. Now, if you call that elitism, fine, but it's certainly not elitism in any way as extreme as that which is practiced by these 15 or 20 universities. Well, then really what we're talking about is not elitism, but leadership. <sighs> leadership, of course, would not be my word, you know, Sam. You know, it's, I know, yes. It, it's a, no, the reason why it's not past, my word is it, it's a modern word. Uh, you know, if you look in the, uh, you know, I've, I've just gotten onto this. If you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, that's a new word. Uh, no, no, you know, I mean, it's old in the sense of the English parliamentary leader, but as in place of ruling, governing. Well, I'm afraid that it, ruling it comes really out of German sociology and out of the word ruling is ruling is not a word on which yeah. we're going to going to yeah, have. Yeah, but those are the things. Those are the kinds of questions one has to face. Happy love. Now I'd like to go. That's all right. Uh, let's go to the questions from the audience. Who would who has a question? Yes. Would you stand up, please? I will re I will repeat your question to make sure that everyone's heard it. I'm John Perellis. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you came. And uh, I'd like to congratulate the professor for pronouncing my name right. It's about the only thing he got right. Um, well, we're about on an equal level that way. <laughs> There are a number of points I'd like to make. I won't take as long as he took attacking me. Um, first of all, Mr. Lippmann, um, you tried to do a preemptive strike in your introduction saying that the consuming network of critics, fans, and publicists of rock were the people who attacked Mr. Bloom's chapter. Um, I trust that as a critic of classical music, you don't feel constrained to speak up for it or consider yourself an authority on it. Um, Why should I, as a critic of popular music, be considered part of a consuming network, and you, as a critic of classical music, be considered a crusader for the high arts? Uh, is that your question? No. That's well, um, uh, I don't know that it's a time for statements. It's really a time for questions. Well, I'll for 10 minutes on end. Well, uh, Mr. Perel, no, 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 let him go. But, 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 but Alan, then we need the rhetorical Alan, questions. Just make your statement, Alan, and I'll say something in response. Alan, wait a moment. I think the protests on behalf of that famous oppressed minority, the writers of the New York Times, does go a little bit too far. That is, I think you can deal with the attack. We can deal. No, Mr. I would like to hear for a moment. Then, no, excuse me, Sam. I would like to hear for a moment if it doesn't get out of hand. I said that I thought your criticism was considerably more serious than the other. So, I mean, begin from that, that I didn't treat you in any of this larger way except on the content of the quotes I read. Well, okay, well, from the quotes I read, um, I've studied a little philosophy. I'm not a professor. However, I have a great respect for the word therefore which is a philosophical word that means something in logic. Um, and you have a way of turning therefore into a kind of three-card Monty. Um, you said, for instance, that I wrote in my piece that because popular music is mass art versus aristocratic art, therefore we should not have our aristocratic art. That is not my therefore. That is your therefore. And that is a supposition that was not part of the initial I said, I, but I said that it was my, uh, that I, I drew it since there's no indication in what you said that you were thinking of another kind of art as part of the American scene. If you did, then I accept my correction. Okay, correction number two. Um, I wrote that technologically Eurocentrism is over. Um, what I meant was the electronic media um, sort of scrambling all of the world's cultures, giving us whatever we want to hear. But you claim that everything technological is Eurocentric. I hope that your watch is not Japanese, because I'm sure you're, you're... Where do you think, I mean, do you really regard Japanese technology as not part of the Western no. science tradition? No, it's not Europe. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I, I think, the, I'm sorry, I think yeah. moderator's privilege. I do think we have to move on. I do think we oh, have to move on. Let him make on. the third point. No, let him make the third point. I mean, I think this is fair. Um, the third point is that, that you claim that to listen to other musical cultures, to listen to relative, is relativism, which makes me an advocate of slavery and human sacrifice. Um, this, this, but this was your leap of logic from relativism. And, to, um, and you're talking about Placido Domingo and Del Canto. Um, I think that you have to address the question of, and here is my question, what happens when you know that 
In African culture, there is extremely complex, intelligent rhythm beyond the, the bounds of European rhythm, much more sophisticated, much smarter. You just wipe that out and say it's a lower culture. In Indian music, there is a much more complex system of pitch relationships. There's a much more complex improvisational kind of music. You wipe that out. It is, it, music raises these issues in the 20th century, yeah. and I don't think that you've dealt with that seriously. I think all times have always raised such issues. I don't think this is anything particularly new of the 20th century. That kind of, you know, the, uh, it is precisely this notion uh, that we place with pluriculturalism. Therefore, it's most important in the United States to uh, concentrate on diversity. I think precisely at this moment in the United States, it could be very well argued that what we have to concentrate is on what unifies that if, if we're to have any kind of a nation. Now, the, to the extent that it is simply musical, but that was not the way you put it. Uh, it was uh, uh, passion versus reason. This is a universal phenomenon that we are taking in other cultures. And what I suggested is precisely you didn't say anything about adopting those ways. But the serious question is, can we make the kind of thing that Nietzsche discussed with her, with all of these influences, any kind of a unified or a cultured art, or is it just going to be a bombardment of absolutely diverse strains? And what I talked about, when I talked about slavery, when I talked about the harem, when I talked about human sacrifice and so on, I was addressing this larger issue. When people say, ah, we have to, we have been too narrow, we have been into one culture. In the first place, I think that's demagogic and not true. But in the second place, what is implied, music is part of a whole culture. There's not a musical culture as such. And the question is, are we taking seriously what that musical culture implies in way of a whole culture? And is not that multiculturalism which we're looking for either a terribly dumbed down thing where we find a common denominator or we really take it seriously and go to the extremes of different cultures? And I do think that is indeed our danger. And I've tried to argue this somewhat co coherently and that the experience, the you know, passion, abandonment of reason, all this kind of lingo, which in its own form is American, was the kind of thing that set up the atmosphere around you know, Hitlerian fascism. That we really are going, no, 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 don't just, uh, uh, there's good reason. What you call Eurocentrism, I would call the tradition of reason and so on, but, but in a way you, 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 you identify them, there is no such philosophic tradition outside the West, is what, for example, equality and human rights are connected with. If you say that that is a limited tradition, then it means to say that it must be transcended. Are we going to preserve human rights in this new culture, this new cosmopolitan culture? Are we going to be able to? Are we going to have any grounds for it? Alan, can we go on? Yeah, but it's precisely, you argue, for the hierarchy of passion over reason. There are a lot of people here, and I think we have to go on. Can we go on? Is there another question, please? Yeah, I can't see where you are. See. 
I, I don't. I think uh, <laughs> that is. Uh, that was a uh, question from David Sidorsky, professor of philosophy at Columbia University. Uh, I don't know that I can rephrase it except to say that I guess, <laughs> I guess, I guess David was asking, I guess David was asking, and maybe that's the question you should, I, yes, isn't rock music subject to the same standards of better or worse as other forms of human enterprise. Well, that can mean two things. I mean, within rock music, apparently rock musicians, I think I even have some sense of it, can, can rank inside uh, the, uh, and that, you know, I think one can see that. And somebody like Zappa, for example, obviously has, you know, more musical skills. The Beatles had more skills. I don't than, agree at than, all. Than, uh, than the Beach Boys. <laughs> well, you know, since I have no competence, but I would say that, you know, that there are within this you know, some really musical people. I'd be quite willing to admit that. Uh, and uh, and in, uh, that's one sense in which. The other would be, what is the best food for the soul? You know, you see, I mean, the, 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 you know, and that, the, it is that. You know, people talk about, you know, you know, my book is not in favor of absolutism. It never uses that word. But for keeping open the philosophic questioning against the, the claim of radical relativism, that philosophical questioning can never end, can never culminate. And, uh, the, uh, the, and, and there is one point of view where there can be very little doubt that we have some guidance. That is, if you take a six-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old child, You've got to make up your mind. Are you going to teach him bullfighting, essentially? Or are you going to teach him mathematics? There is a whole range of possible human temptations. You can say, let the child develop. You know, let him do his own. You have to make some indication of what is good, partly for this particular human being. But this particular human being, you have to understand somehow if the child is sickly, that you have to take in consideration. If the child is stupid or if the child is smart, you have to take that into consideration. If the child has a good musical ear and so on. But th that all leads us towards some notion which we have to take into account of human perfection. What you know, a well-fed, a fully developed human being, something we can admire is. And that is absolutely unavoidable. And uh, you're, you're, you know, nobody who deals with education or nobody who tries to live his own life seriously can take the kind of relativism that says those questions aren't serious, seriously. I'm sorry, it's just impossible. And uh, within that, I take it as somehow evident that the degree of rock music, that which, is, which is in the life curriculum of young people, overdoes it in comparison to other things both because of the amount of time and the, the, the intensity given to it. It's very hard to attach oneself to other things. It really sets very high models. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the other side of it is that it really gives a picture, almost universally there are, of a certain kind of serious or non-serious erotic relationship, certain kinds of relations to parents, human beings, which are expressed in the music itself, which are in conflict with other kinds of learning. Now, they, this is a problem, I mean, because it does in some sense express a whole spirit of the time, which is accepted in large measure by the adult world. The fact is that in this democracy, and Plato said it would be true in all democracies, it's very hard for teachers to be teachers because nobody recognizes the possible superiority of any human being no matter you know, what the question of the age, over another human being, that a teacher is, at least in that instance and in that respect, superior to the youngster. And this is a kind of extreme development of all those passions of democracy. So it, one cannot help but avoid uh, the, the question of this particular f form of taste, this particular uh, passion or addiction in relation to other things you wish children had. Yes. Yes. Many ages have described their youth as impious and called their music licentious. My question is, what is going to change? Well, two things. Uh, the, uh, I didn't call the youth impious in this. 
And I don't call them particularly licentious. That isn't my argument. Uh, the, uh, I take it for granted, particularly, you know, outside of the narrowest, of perhaps powerful narrowest cultures, that kids from the age of 12 on are going to be obsessed largely by nothing else but sex, either consciously or unconsciously. And that education has to appeal to that and use that motive and develop that motive. The question is whether rock doesn't, you know, approach it, you know, get the subject in one way, and uh, you, know, you know, I mean, to the, the music of Schubert is, or much music, is highly sensual, but you know, it takes an hour to get through a quintet, you know, and uh, there are all kinds of, of, well, of developments and so on, which in the three or five or six minute video. You just can't do, and that, that is more the issue. It's not me yelling, ah, impiety. You know, the, uh, the, the, I mean, I think that could perhaps be legitimately done, but it isn't me, and it isn't my taste, and it isn't what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is an enemy of good taste and the enemy of the development of philosophic understanding, and that was my perspective. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, now, you know, usually there are complaints in every age. In some ages, is right, you know, you know, and we'll have to, you know, you know, you know the, the kind of argument which says you shouldn't uh, say these things because they're said in the past uh, would deprive us of our most precious and necessary critical capacity. If there is we sometimes something new, misuse though. it. What? There is something new in this situation, and I think you have referred to it in your book. It's true that there was a time uh, in the 19th century, for instance, when there was a phenomenon called Wagner mania. It is true that if you read, for instance, the short stories of Thomas Mann, you find two stories in particular, Tristan and The Blood of the Veilzugs, which deal with really the most extreme, though quietly very uh, 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 closely stated, very quietly stated examples of the human predicament. The first one is a, a woman, a tubercular patient who conceives a very distant relationship with a man she meets in the sanitarium. And then she plays for him the prelude and the love death from Tristan and the excitement causes decline in her condition and she starts to hemorrhage. The story ends there. In the second story, The Blood of the Veilzungs is a real-life reenactment re of the first act of Die Valkyrie in which brother and sister sleep with each other. And it's true that these mirrored intense preoccupations in the society, but they were preoccupations limited to only a few on the top layer of society economically. What we have now is a world in which, as Professor Bloom said, it cuts across, the phenomenon cuts across horizontally and vertically. This is a different situation. This is a mass cultural phenomenon, not a high cultural phenomenon. So this situation is different and very, uh, I think, very crucial. Yes. Good evening, Professor Bloom. My name is uh, Martin Crocia, and I am a lecturer on Nietzsche and Freud at the New School of Social Research. Uh, as you're aware from your book, I've read your book very, very carefully. I admire it in some ways and don't admire it in other ways, but perhaps we can discuss it another time. Um, you are aware of the fact that Nietzsche maintained that there's a basic incompatibility between democracy and high culture. And, his, and uh, you voice that in your own fears that the last man may become. My question to you is a very specific one. Once, assuming that what this phenomenon that has uh, overtaken American society is a vulgar taste, let's just assume that. Assume that a vulgar taste has overtaken a democratic society. What can be done within the confines of a democratic society to overturn that without the establishment of an aristocratic society? Uh, absolutely. No, 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 that's a very, uh, very legitimate question. I'm glad you asked that. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you see, one of the reasons why I resist the kind of extreme language of either side, you know, is Frank Zappa's, you know, this, uh, Frank Zappa's, this is a criminal society, is that 
However vulgar this society may be, it isn't the worst thing. It, it obviously can't be. You know, we, this experiences of the 20th century give us a fair spectrum of what's worst. And uh, Nietzsche taught us to think the last man was the worst thing. And it, I resist that because I would prefer, you know, my Uncle Mo with his feet up on the, uh, the couch watching TV, uh, you know, in all of his last man tastes to a committed SS officer. You know, the, uh, and uh, the, one must not be uh, you know, charmed into uh, to, to the uh, you know, to thinking a bad situation is horrible. The uh, what uh, you know, but I do think, of course, we have gotten to a point which is, in some sense, worse than that. Sort of obviously described by Nietzsche in Germany in 1880. I mean, where he could count on the awareness, you know, of classical and biblical. Uh, cultures, if you like, to keep up the tension of the soul, even when you know they were, you know, without the force, you know, compelling power they once had, and we've lost that almost completely. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's hardly present. And uh, the, my my book is, I believe, a democratic book, you know, in the best in the sense. Let's try to preserve within democracy, but that means to say preserving certain kinds of distinctions. Because we not only, with this relativism, not only causes us to lose our taste, it also threatens democracy, which itself obviously is not relativistic. You know, it makes a claim for the good society. So my book tries to be moderate. And of course, I would fear for the extremes that, uh, that could come out of a hatred of its vulgarity, the snobbism which hated the bourgeoisie so much in Europe. I, mean, I think one of the tastes of a democracy, one of the things one must most learn is to how to, live, how to live with vulgarity, recognizing it's not the worst thing, you know, and cultivate one's own spiritual garden. But if one is a teacher, trying to help others become aware of certain kinds of things, then they must free themselves from certain of the prejudices which makes it impossible for them even to learn the things of the past. All right? Yes, one more question. Yes. I appreciate the question. Yeah. Well, my book was not about rock and uh, rock and roll. It wasn't even about Margaret Mead. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, my understanding, uh, and I, I hope I didn't offend you. This is well. I thought you said you had a short question. That was very short, and it said why. Uh, and, and there was a question mark at the end of that. Why? Why do you call her that? Or is there is there more to the short question? The coming of age in Samoa. Are what? Are sexual adventures as well? Uh, mm, well. You know, I suppose we all are more or less, but uh, the uh, the uh, but uh, what I meant to say is that that book, which I gather, I believe to be when I read it, but also gather has been uh, shown to be both inaccurate and misleading, uh, had an a kind of very simple-minded intention: let's loosen up these Americans. Uh, that it was a kind of, that she herself uh, admittedly enjoyed this, and that it was a kind of very narrow, private indulgence that she wanted to impose on the country. That's what I mean. Sorry. Well, on that, thank you for coming, Professor Bloom. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.